Kara is a doctor of naturopathic medicine from the National College of Natural Medicine in Portland, Oregon, as well as faculty member and certified practitioner at the Institute for Functional Medicine. Kara has recently published one of the most exciting uh, studies in the field of uh, lifestyle longevity medicine, uh, which shows that diet and lifestyle can make us two years younger in just eight weeks. Specifically, she showed that some molecules on the top of our DNA called epigenetic marks can revert to a younger state after a multimodal intervention involving a nutrient-dense diet, intermittent fasting, and stress reduction. Cara, thank you very much for being with us today. Absolutely. Yeah, it's great to be here with you, Lucia. So, Cara, before going uh, into the details uh, of the study, could you tell us a bit, a little bit more about what epigenetic is, your work in the field, and how epigenetics can impact our longevity? Sure, sure. So. Um, you know, back in the early 2000s, the genome, the human genome was mapped every we were all very excited. It was kind of, well, it's been heady times in science for quite a while, but that was a big achievement. And scientists uh, anticipated discovering sort of a one gene uh, mutation, one disease relationship. Like if you had heart disease, you would have a gene mutation here. If you had cancer, you'd have a gene mutation here. And really kind of the overwhelming discovery was that it's infinitely more complex than one gene, one disease relationship. And there's these very sophisticated interactions. And I think it was that event that really catapulted the science of epigenetics forward. Because the next question was, environment, how does environment impact genetic expression? So it's really not about the gene so much as the environment that's influencing expression. So in comes the field of epigenetics. I mean, it's been around for a long time, um, but it really has just moved into the fore of kind of the science revolution that we're in. And it is involved in looking at, as you said, marks, biochemical processes, um, that influence how DNA is expressed. And what we became interested in is a specific type of epigenetic mark called DNA methylation. DNA methylation is of all the epigenetic marks to the most researched um, for a variety of reasons. It seems to be the most resilient and perhaps the most impactful. But of course, you know, as sciences, we're going to learn more and more. But lots of attention is there in DNA methylation. As a clinician, as a functional medicine clinician, uh, of course, we've been interested in how nutrients impact biochemistry. Um, I did my postdoctorate training in addition to a residency in a laboratory looking at, um, you know, nutrients and um, uh, organic acids, looking at products of biochemical reactions in the body and thinking about nutrient influences. So that's where my head was. And with epigenetics, um, it was clear that how, what we're eating, the supplements we're taking uh, can influence what DNA is on and off. And so with DNA methylation, when there is a methyl group, which is just a carbon and three hydrogens on a gene that tends or multiple methyl, methyl groups that turns the gene off, generally speaking. And when those methyl groups are removed, that allows the gene to be expressed. Um, you know, move over to the work of biological aging and Steve Horvath out of UCLA, he discovered that DNA methylation patterns actually very consistently change with age. Uh, and so we can predict with, you know, great accuracy, a person's chronological age, um, 
you know, from even in utero where they're negative because they haven't been born yet to centenarians. Um, and so the, so being able to actually assess biological age relative to chronological age is a new tool that we're using in the space of DNA um, methylation and something that we uh, became interested in optimizing. So can we optimize our biological age um, relative to our chronological age um, using diet and lifestyle interventions? Can we impact genetic expression? And so I want to just stop there and let you kind of tease out what I said and ask me any questions. <laughs> oh, yes, this is exciting. And uh, so in a nutshell, you are uh, uh, telling us that we can be biologically younger or older than our chronological age, that epigenetics can play a role in this process and can even help us measure our biological age, which can be extremely helpful in the, in the context of lifestyle intervention, where we want to actually measure whether we are doing something good for our health and we don't want to wait um, years <laughs> to see whether we, uh, this is making uh, um, leave us longer or not, so that we can, uh, we exactly can right. fine tune uh, the interventions and, uh, uh, and uh, get to our younger self, right? Yeah, that's yeah. exactly right. Yes. Yeah. Doing longevity trials in humans because we live for so long is, is obviously prohibitive. And so this is, it's interesting. This is the DNA, the DNA methylation clocks are surrogate markers of longevity and seeing whether our interventions can actually tweak them. But, you know, science is really suggesting that they're also the drivers, you know, of, of, of health span or, or disease states. So there's something to specifically optimizing DNA methylation that's more than just, say, turning back the clock as measured by the DNA methylation marks, but really improving health span as well. It's yeah. extraordinary and, and, and quite cool. Yeah, this is, a, this is an exciting uh, uh, field of science. I'm actually teaching this topic uh, in, uh, in this course. And uh, although we are just scratching the surface uh, about the mechanistic um, details of this process, it's clear that uh, epigenetics does play, play a role in aging and uh, it's helping us now in intervention uh, trials like this one. So, and this brings me to my next question. So we know that lifestyle and lifestyle intervention can impact genetics. And so which kind of uh, lifestyle intervention did you implement in your uh, study? Can you tell us a little mm -hmm. more about the, yeah. study, the people involved? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, we know from... Of course, you know, your colleague and, and um, Dr. Randy Jordal that, you know, nutrients can profoundly impact epigenetic um, expression via his agouti mouse research, which you've probably, I'm sure you've talked to your class about. Um, it's extraordinary, right? His study, his and Waterland study was the most cited study in the history of science, which is extraordinary. So you can see how moved we are by this ability for nutrition to influ influence epigenetic expression. It's a big, big, big deal. So nutrition was our first piece. We're looking specifically at DNA methylation. So we wanted our diet to be as rich in, in, in methyl donors as possible. Um, so that's going to be uh, folate, actually a full complement of B vitamins, betaine, such as we find in, in beets. Um, and that complement of B vitamins is coming from uh, green leafies. It's coming from nuts and seeds. It's coming from uh, some animal protein. We wanted our participants to do a little bit of liver, not every day, but some. It's really an extraordinary superfood if you're willing to eat it. Uh, some eggs, a lot of colorful veggies, mushrooms, which are, you know, methyl donor really kind of superfoods, if you will, particularly shiitake and enoki and maitake. Um, so rich in methyl donors, folate, B12, betaine, B vitamins, um, minerals like magnesium, potassium, and zinc. Um, and also rich in this category that we've termed methylation adaptogens. These are compounds that have been shown, these are phyto, polyphenols, phytonutrients that have been shown to influence uh, DNA methylation enzymes. So in some cases, they're inhibiting um, the enzymatic activity. And, you know, in all of the studies we looked at, and 
well, I'd say in the vast majority of studies that we looked at, and most of these are cell studies uh, and animal studies, the influence of these phytonutrients was favorable, um, turning on genes that we really want on, and in some cases, turning off genes that we don't want. So these so-called methylation adaptogens are everywhere. We're eating them all the time. We're, we're talking about green tea or EGCG in green tea and some of the other polyphenols, turmeric, um, what else? Luteolin, uh, lutein, quercetin, um, and really the, the elegiac acid, the list goes on. Resveratrol, another famous one. So these molecules that we've been using in Western medicine, but really in traditional medicines the world over for time immemorial, turn out to be very epigenetically active. And so our diet was packed with those as well. We um, they had at least about seven cups of veggies a day, really probably closer to nine when you add in the beets. So a, a very veggie dense diet. Um, berries are rich in these methylation adaptogens. So there was some berries and a little bit of apple. Apple has a lot of quercetin. Um, and then we used a polyphenol product. We used um, Metagenics Phytoganics, which is a, you know just a dense organic clean greens food. And we had them take two servings of that per day. So an additional layering of, of these epigenetically active compounds. We gave them a probiotic lactobacillus plantarum um, V299, which is also from Metagenics. It's Metagenics Ultra ultraflora intensive. That particular probiotic we chose because there's some evidence that it can help support synthesis of folate from the gut microbiome. So another methyl donor. So that was our diet component. Any questions on that before I jump in the rest of it? No, just a comment. I think, I think it's very interesting, uh, first of all, um, that the, the synergy between the nutrients we get with the nutrient dense, dense diet and the microbes yes. in our gut. Yes. And so really, I, I see this trend uh, when um, in longevity medicine, uh, an emphasis or combining interventions, yes. data interventions, intervention uh, uh, in our microbiome. And uh, this is, uh, I think, something very interesting and important. Yep. Another comment is that um, your, uh, your diet was also a low carbohydrate diet. And mm -hmm. I think... Uh, uh, the the rationale is also that by limiting actually carbohydrate, you at the same time increase the nutrient density of the diet because at the uh, with the same uh, calories uh, you are you are actually introducing more uh, nutrients per calories per. That's exactly right. Yeah. So this is something, for example, that. Uh, that we also see sometimes in our in our studies, uh, Stanford with a clinical trial with low carb uh, and comparing low carb and low fat diets, and yes. surprisingly, actually the low carb arm was eating more vegetables because they they they, they needed to cut on uh, on grains and other calorie uh, other foods that provide calories. So they they actually were, were forced to eat more of the nutrient dense food foods. That's so fascinating. That's yeah. exactly right. Yeah, you're packing so much nutritional, extraordinary nutritional information into each bite and much there's no there's really no fluff. Yes, it was a it was so it was it was um, low carbohydrate. We did intermittent fasting. We layered that in just very gentle 12 hours on 12 hours off. To, and, and both of those pieces encourage a little bit of ketone, which as you know, ketone production is potently anti-inflammatory and ep epigenetically influencing in a favorable way as well. Um, what else? And it was anti-inflammatory. So no grain. We pulled out dairy. We even pulled out legumes and beans which I'm a big fan of, and we want our participants to, you know, move into consuming them after the diet. But just for that, you know, intense eight weeks, we wanted to pull out all potential um, contributors to inflammation. The other piece I wanted to say to you as well is that, um, you know, just going back to a comment that you made about combination, that's, I think that's the nature of the beast. Like, consuming these complex packets of polyphenolic information um, into a healthy microbiome, that 
is where the bang for our buck goes. And, and, and it's something that we're thinking about, you know, how can we tease out? So of course we wanna research our protocol again, and we're working on that and, and I can give you some information. So we wanna to continue to do that. We're launching something in the summer. And additionally, we're thinking about how we can kind of drill down into some of those more, um, you know, fascinating mechanistic details, like what's happening at the microbiome. Oh, this is fascinating. And uh, um, one question about the study population. So these were all healthy people. And this yes. you you were able actually to, to measure uh, rejuvenation, biological rejuvenation. Yes, that's do right. You, what do you think? If uh, uh, had you uh, tested people that were uh, unhealthy or with metabolic issues, uh, would you have expected to have, uh, I don't know, a, 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 an even greater effect on biological age or lesser? Uh, what are your thoughts on that? I think we, I think the research is pretty clear that you have a greater effect on biological age. When you've got somebody who has diabetes or cardiovascular disease or autoimmunity, it's all of the, all of the chronic diseases of aging, actually, even interestingly, COVID fits in here, is you know, push, accelerate the aging journey. They all accelerate aging. And so by extension, if you can turn around that disease state, you're going to turn around um, that, you're going to stop that accelerated aging. And, and, and one study actually, just thinking about Nathan, Nathan Price's work, um, I think they saw in their population, you know, those with diabetes were six years older. And they also saw that when they adhered to their um, intervention that they lowered their age. They're, they weren't using the DNA methylation biological clock. They were looking at, you know, standard chemistries um, that you could get from a Quest lab, but it was, but they, they saw that and other studies corroborate that very finding. Yes, I agree with your, uh, with your thoughts. I would also expect uh, probably uh, a greater effect in uh, unhealthy people. Although mm -hmm. I think um, it's also important to talk about precision longevity medicine. So there might be uh, in, uh, among like people that are uh, have metabolic issues, people that have uh, so-called sticky epigenetic changes that are a little bit, uh, they take a little lo longer time to revert to uh, a healthier, yeah. younger state. And this may not apply yes. to everybody. Um, yes, and uh, I see these also. For example, some of my students are athletes. They mm -hmm. go and take their biological age test, and they find out that are actually older, biologically older than uh, yeah. than the chronological age, and they are surprised because they are doing everything right. What I well, think is happening there is that there are some epigenetic signals that perhaps reflect like a physical stress that is transient in these uh, in these athletes is actually signaling uh, 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 a sur survival pathways that make up make them younger but is captured as an aging signal and so i think there is still some work to do to really personalize those aging clocks to different subgroup of people. So what are your That's fascinating. That? I, mean, I just think it's fascinating. Oh my goodness. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I was there working with you. It's so yeah. interesting. So there's a few thoughts that I have. One, we know that there's a heritability component and this might be the sticky piece that you're talking about. I think that that's reasonable. But a lot of us, you know, when I was writing our book, which I'm, st I'm, I'm still working on, but we're sort of move, move through the heavy lifting and really in the science around heritability, um, you know, a lot of us came from sort of a more thrifty epigenome type, you know, to sort of land in this land of plenty and kind of throw ourselves off epigenetically. I think a lot of us are epigenetically programmed to move towards metabolic syndrome and cardiometabolic disease, interestingly enough. I think those are sticky changes and that it, what it means in general is that we need healthy eating patterns require um, sticking to it, you know, and doing it over many cell cycles. But by the same token, and I know you know this as well, some genes turn on and off, you know, really quickly. And I think we're still teasing it out. The other piece that you're saying, and that I just want to acknowledge and appreciate is, yeah, 
I mean, in somebody who is a uh, professional athlete or very elite athlete, you what you see epigenetically, uh, their particular clock could be different. There is some research on elite athletes that we talk about in our study that shows accelerated aging. And I mean, and we do know just... Uh, clinic, looking at looking at data on adrenal function, looking at cortisol, that that there tends to be a drop after the performance season, and there tends to be an increase in respiratory infections and so forth in elite athletes. So there is some wear happening. Is that fine though? And th is that you know a good thing? And do we need to kind of spin the clock to fit their phenotype and others' phenotypes, or you know are they overdoing it? Yeah, you know. A, yeah, and this I think it's it's a personalized question. Of, yeah. of course, many of those people, ma many athletes are probably overdoing that, um, and yeah. uh, and uh, uh, and also I think exercise in general, but also fasting, are or or hormetic interventions. So at low doses that, they are beneficial, at so high doses they can uh, yeah. do more harm than good, and so. Yeah. Uh, like reaching the sweet spot, it's uh, it's uh, it's difficult and it's a personalized uh, issue. That's right. Yeah, it really requires paying attention. We in our study, we did an exercise prescription that was really you know fairly. It was it was it was pretty easy. We had healthy men in our study. Some of these guys were big exercise like you know CrossFit um, aficionados and so forth, and they actually had to dial it back, which was difficult for a, for for a few of them. Um, just. 30 minutes a day, at least five days a week with 60 to 80% perceived exertion, which for somebody doing CrossFit, this is going to be nothing. And <laughs> I, I, I know one individual was uncomfortable about that, but we decided we just wanted to turn the volume down a little bit for what you're saying exactly and just and our read on the literature. But, you know, my 80% is, you know, different than yours. So it was really based on their perceived exertion. So, you know, for some of them, it was probably um, easy and for others, it was, well, yeah, I mean, it was it, the, within, the, within that structure, it was individualized. Um, yeah. We wanted them to sleep. Uh, you know, you, the, the data on decent sleep is for, and DNA methylation, I think, are strong. Again, we're looking at a lot of animal studies, but there's enough human data out there to show that insomnia messes up um, epigenetic expression, really, period. And it can be a pro-aging thing. And it's very interesting. And we're just at the beginning, but um, we we can't make them sleep as a part of our study, but we offered them sleep hygiene tips. And we did have, co we had nutritionists who were working, who were, who were, um, with them, they had a they had a commitment to having a weekly meeting for at least the first four weeks of the study to answer any questions on um, the nutrient program, any and they would give them the sleep hygiene tips and so forth. It was a very dry, scripted encounter. It wasn't a cheerleading session as sometimes you'll see in our practice. It was very dry, but um, within that, they would talk to them about the exercise requirements, the sleep requirements, the nutrients, and the and the diet. And we also had a meditation component as well, which you know, again, has really cool data around it and, you know, optimizing DNA expression and data on, on biological aging. So um, we included two sessions per day of 10 minutes each um, using the relaxation response um, as developed by Herbert Benson. So it's been used in, in, in many trials before and it's, um, you know, it's doable, it's, it's easy and, and our, our participants were able to adhere um, to that. Actually, our participants were, were able to adhere to all of our study components um, remarkably well, and, and I'd like to publish on that. Um, and I think a piece of it was the fact that we had nutrition, they, they had a commitment to touching base with a, a nutritionist um, at least once a week, and they could, they could have additional uh, contact with them via, through an app that we were using and, you know, and other means if, as needed. Oh, this is a this is really a fascinating uh, study design. While uh, while it's difficult to disentangle uh, which of these components was more critical for which people, on the other side, I truly believe that uh, any effective lifestyle uh, intervention is a multimodal intervention. Yes, uh, I was. I was just reading yesterday, the editor of Aging actually published an interesting um, kind of a, 
uh, a review looking at the various interventions on longevity, and he was saying that there's no good data on, on quercetin unless you combine it with a biologic, you know, the data on curcumin is pretty poor. And I was thinking, because it needs to exist in combination, you know, I think when we isolate these nutrients and look at longevity data in animals or whatever, you know, it's, they're, it's, I think that they give us enough sort of hints of possibility, but I don't, we're not prescribing them the way that we're supposed to be. <laughs> well, that's so true. So yeah, synergy, synergy, su success uh, in longevity medicine. And so, so on this topic, um, it's difficult to be good at, every single piece of these interventions. So for example, I'm, I'm very good with diet and, and exercise and I'm terrible with sleep. Uh, what's, uh, what's your weakest link? Yeah, I, I, I'm, it's this, I think it's the same with the exception of the fact that my COVID diet, good nutrient choices, too much. Um, but yeah, sleep has been my weakest link as well. And um, I, you know, part of just being very conscious of it, developing our study protocol, paying attention, reading the literature on sleep and um, the outcome of not getting enough sleep. And I've got a toddler at home and she, I, I for me to survive, I've, it's demanded that I improve my sleep fitness. And, um, and so it ha with intention and focus, it has gotten better. Um, sleep hygiene tips, really, honestly, I think when you have trouble sleeping, you sl you think these sleep hygiene tips. I you know when I was in full throes of insomnia, I thought these sleep hygiene tips were so stupid. But in fact, collectively they were they have been beneficial for me. And one of the biggest ones is going to bed on time, you know, and not staying up later um, because I'm awake. Um, what else? Keeping my room cool. Using I have a cool mist humidifier. Making sure that you know investing in really good blackout shades. You know none of these you know, poor quality blackouts, but really making my room nice and dark and cool, a very comfortable bed, um, you know, no caffeine after noon. Um, I can't do an intense workout late. I cannot eat late, you know, so just gathering all of these, um, maybe, all, may, maybe each of them is contributing, you know, five to 10% to my overall sleep quality, but taken together, it's made a big difference. Yeah, no, I agree. The power of simple uh, uh, interventions, effective intervention uh, is uh, underestimated. And what yeah. about the, the role of uh, supplements in a, in a healthy lifestyle? You did mention that you, you use some supplements in your study. Do you take any supplements and do you think they may yeah. be more relevant in some situations, uh, uh, more stressed yes. or uh, uh, for some purposes? I, um, I'm, I, I have, I take supplements. I'm very excited about the possibility of supplements. I take, you know, the things that I'm not able to consume in my diet. I'm not a big green tea drinker. I just don't like the tannic taste. So I take a green tea extract. Um, I'm not getting enough curcumin. I take curcumin. I think it's just extremely important. Um, what else? I like the tartary buckwheat product that's that's kind of new in the world. Um, it's got luteolin. It's got a little quercetin. It's got um, hydroxymethylbutyrate, uh, HMB, which is kind of a, uh, a, a, it's a leucine metabolite that seems to be helpful with muscle and strength and so forth. And anyway, I, so I like looking at and experimenting with su supplements. I know one of the sexy anti-aging supplements, um, nic nicotinamide riboside, um, I've been experimenting with. So I'm a fan of supplements and I think there's a place for them if you're not getting enough of the adaptogens. I think, you know, there's, we can, we, we can take some in the context of a whole foods diet, not isolated. You know, I don't know that you're going to be getting a lot of bang for your buck if you're taking a couple of capsules of quercetin in a McDonald's diet. Exactly. Um. <laughs> exactly. This is an important point that I also try to deliver in my course. You know, there are first there are things that are important you need to take care of now, and then once that is covered, you can start experimenting, as you pointed out, in uh, with the uh, uh, with new interventions because many of uh, of the new ingredients in longevity medicine are are still uh, are yet to be proven in human clinical trials. 
Um, so everyone has to uh, weigh the, the risk and benefits and uh, um, experiment and measure. And uh, yeah, I'm very curious to know more about your uh, NAD booster experiments. We can do another podcast on that topic. I, I, <laughs> yeah. I do. I, I did a little research on that. And um, it's, uh, it's an exciting, but also like tricky field, especially scientifically. It's very difficult to interpret. There is a ton of information out there. And uh, I think uh, there, there, are, there, there is uh, most of this information is not well curated. It's difficult to reconcile the studies well, that have been done in, uh, in animals, uh, most of them, uh, and those in humans, which way of administration, which dose, and, uh, uh, and uh, the results. Where, yeah. uh, so it's, it's complicated. Yeah, but, um, uh, certainly exciting. Anyway, it's so exciting. I w well, let me just um, okay. I know we could, keep go we could keep going, but you know, a lot of these nutrients, when we isolate them and we take them in high doses, you you really confront a U curve relationship, right? Yeah. Too much, too little. There's a sweet spot that needs to be found, and so I I just want to say I absolutely agree with you, and that fundamental component was, you know, it was a, a, a pillar of our original question that, 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 that prompted us to devise the study. Um, could we be changing DNA methylation negatively by, you know, loading up on methyl donor, loading up on folate or B12 and so forth? And, and, and that was a, a, a big piece of our, our interest in this area and to create this program. And this is so true. And also with the, the NAD booster is true. So they, they also work, actually, they can enhance NAD level through uh, production of uh, um, uh, nico uh, nicotinamide mononucleotide. But NAM is also a, an inhibitor by feedback inhibition of uh, uh, NAD synthesis and, and can inhibit actually uh, NAD dependent enzymes. So hmm. Yeah, it's, uh, it's it's tricky, and uh, and uh, the role of uh, high quality um, supplements is also important because yes, uh, yeah, NAD booster can uh, naturally um, be broken down to an NAM, so you want to know what's inside the bottle you are buying. <laughs> no, that's very interesting. Yeah, of course. Yeah, there's a lot of questions, and then it so it does. It just brings us back to a food, a clean food forward approach as being um, the smartest, and then. I do, you know, I think layering on some experimentation into a healthy milieu can be kind of fun and, but there, but it is, but there are a lot of questions. I appreciate you looking at NAD. Well, yeah, we'll definitely have to talk about yes, that. We, uh, I am. And that's why this course is called Longing for Longevity from Biology to Biohacking. We <laughs> acknowledge that you know, there are some, uh, there is something we know, the biology, and we try to teach that but also something we don't know. The biohacking part, you know, biohacking is uh, very often associated with the, with the negative connotations, but I think uh, it's clear that now we are all biohackers. We are trying to optimize our health, uh, experimenting safely with ourselves, knowing the science, and, uh, and uh, um, in this way, way we can really help advance the field. And so yeah. thank you very much, Cara. Absolutely. for uh, having contributed to uh, our uh, knowledge that we are looking forward to turning into action. And uh, so can you, uh, where can people uh, find more about uh, you and your work? You can come to our website. Please come join us. It's just drcarafitzgerald.com. Um, we do, we are going to be embarking in short order, you know, in the next couple of months on a beta 100 um, launch where we'll have 100 uh, people working with us in the in the digital program that we're developing of our study. So they'll be they'll, they'll be engaging in the study. We'll have IRB approval. We want to publish our results. They'll be getting um, epigenetic baseline and, and, and follow up testing going just traveling with us following the diet and lifestyle interventions and the supplements as well. Um, if you go to the web, if you go to my website, you'll see on the landing page, a link to bio, a blog on biological aging, and that will take you to what we're calling the younger universe. So you can sign up if you want to be at one of the, the beta 100 with us. Um, 
and then we'll eventually, so the beta 100s folks, you'll be kicking the tires of our program and we'll be asking for your feedback and all sorts of that. And it'll be, you'll, you'll have to pay for the products, but everything will be at cost. Um, you'll be a, you know, you'll be a beta tester just along with all of us. And I think it's really exciting and it's not limited to middle-aged men. It's open to all of us. Um, and we'll, you know, we'll, share with you our findings and publish on those and just continue to research it. I've also applied for a grant. Uh, so hopefully we can do another university uh, randomized control trial too. That's exciting, Cara. We need to schedule uh, soon another podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Yes, another we lecture. will. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you very much again for being with us today. Absolutely. Always a pleasure.